So welcome everyone. We acknowledge with deep gratitude that we are on the territory of the Shuswap and the Tunasa nations and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respect to the First Nations and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. In our call to presence, as many of you know, I invite everyone to sit in the silence of the sanctuary in order to prepare oneself for worship and conclude this time with ringing the prayer bowl. I've missed not using it, so will this morning. I have a book by Thich Nhat Hanh called Present Moment, Wonderful Moment, and I'd like to give you my interpretation of the bell that he talks about. Listening to the bell, our mind will become one with the sound as it vibrates along, settles down, and fades away. With the help of a bell, our mind is collected and brought back to the present moment. The bell of mindfulness can be the voice of God calling us back to ourselves, calling us away from distractions and concerns. I invite you to listen to the sound of our bell as you enter into a state of presence. Our opening hymn is Come In, Come In and Sit Down. Thank you, Greg and Carolyn. Come in, come in and sit down. You are Pardon me. Our words of wisdom this morning I found in a, boy's, a book by Joyce Rupp. Uh, the book's called Prayers to Sophia. 
and it's a prayer. Let us pray. Unconditional lover, the days fly by. I run to catch my breath. Underneath my hurry and rush, smug judges try to take over. They speak with resentment, chiding voices of envy and scorn. They rule harshly against others, unleash their poisonous tongues, and pronounce their deadly decisions with unkind critical judgments. Great heart of love, help me to look with soft eyes upon all who are a part of my days. Break through the barriers of my scrutinizing views. Transform my inner landscape into a peaceful place of acceptance. Pull back my projections and criticisms. Replace my mean measurements and my biased expectations with an openness that allows others to be without conforming to my censure. Restore the simple acceptance that was in my heart when I was newly birthed. Cleanse me of the cultural standards that soil my perceptions and keep me from being kind. Amen. And our story time. Our story time this morning, I'm going to be talking about welcoming, <coughs> pardon me, about welcoming and including everyone. Can you recall what it felt like to be new to a group, not knowing anyone there? Were you able to help someone who is new to your group or class? Was there someone who came up to you and said, hi, or maybe you were able to be that person who said, hi, come and join us. In the gospel, Jesus talks to us about welcoming. What are some of the ways that each of us can offer a welcome to a new person? I miss Benny on these mornings, but I know that he and I could be together, if we could be together. We would share our lunch or a snack with you. You could offer to get a glass of water or juice for the new person too, or asking them to sit beside you. Come and sit with us after the service during coffee time. I guess we can do that in our imaginations on these mornings when we have to use Zoom. These are only a few ideas for you. Can you think of any others? Maybe after our Zoom service, you can talk to your parents and come up with even more ideas. What about drawing a picture showing you and your new friend together? All, kind, all kinds of different things you can think of for being welcoming to a new friend who's joined you. So lots to think about with your mom and dad this morning. And now let's move on to the next hymn, There is Room for All, and Carolyn will sing it through three times. And uh, so uh, in the hymn book, it says this song uh, of the inclusive love of God echoes the opening verses of Psalm 91. And uh, so I'm going to sing the second time through in French. Um, but uh, you guys just go ahead and uh, hum along or sing the English version. But I'll give it a whirl. I hope there's no French experts there. <laughs>
The first reading is Genesis 22, 1 to 14. The theme of giving and receiving is in this passage. Some interpret this story as giving all that we can. Others interpret it as Abraham's unquestioning obedience. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I shall show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son, Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the boy, and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his, laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac said to his father, Abraham, Father, and he said, Here I am, my son. He said, The fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built an altar there, and laid the wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord, it shall be provided. The second reading, Romans 6, 12 to 23. Paul describes what leads to freedom. Choosing to follow God means living a life that serves and welcomes one another. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means. 
Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater iniquity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you now are ashamed? The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Gospel reading, Matthew 10, 40-42. In biblical times, people had a communal, yet hierarchical way of living. Welcoming an individual, therefore, meant welcoming the community that she or he represented and what that person stood for. Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me, welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet <clears throat> will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. May we hear sacred wisdom through these human texts. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thanks, Myrna. Welcome. To make someone welcome. Receive and treat someone hospitably. That is the definition, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, which many of you know, is my favorite source. Isn't that what Jesus means when he says, whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. There is a series of books written by Margaret Jensen, the first of which is called, First We Have Coffee. She's the daughter of a Scandinavian pastor in Canada. Norwegians are famous for having coffee all the time. Of course, it doesn't have to be coffee. It could be tea, juice, water, soda. For me, the title has always invoked an invitation, a welcome. Come in and sit down and join us. It is an act of hospitality, of inclusiveness. Our opening hymn has been a favorite of mine since first hearing and singing it at Naramata Center in the Okanagan. Come in, come in and sit down. You are a part of the family. It's inclusive. Everybody is welcome. It's an invitation that says to come in and sit down and let us all be together. For aren't we all one family? It goes on to say, there's rest for the weary and health for us all. There's no distinction between anyone and everyone is included, everyone is an equal. This hymn exemplifies for me and I hope for you too, an all encompassing inclusion of everyone in all things. I have several books by James Taylor in his Everyday Parables he has a short parable around the coffee cup, or transpose that as tea, juice, etc. You get the picture. He writes, the optimist, according to a folk saying, 
thinks the coffee mug is half full. The pessimist thinks it's half empty, but both still drink from their coffee mugs. In our time, the coffee mug symbolizes socialization. Truck drivers and teenagers, gray-haired seniors and back-slapping sales reps, harried executives and unemployed transients, all gather over a mug of coffee and a donut. They do business, they renew friendships, they simply pass time together. Churches serve coffee after their Sunday morning services and there may be more genuine communion over that coffee than in the previous hour of formal worship. If Jesus had lived in the 1990s or now the 2000s, he would probably have raised a coffee mug and said, each time you do this, remember me, end quote. I have used the analogy of a coffee mug now and previously during our story time. I used the idea of sharing a snack or a part of one's lunch. The meaning is the same. It is a welcoming gesture and is all inclusive. Consider who James Taylor mentions in his parable. Truck drivers, teenagers, harried executives, transients. There's no distinction. They are all of an equal. One may think that the transient is not as well educated as the executive, or the truck driver is only a truck driver because he lacks finer skill or lacks ambition. But in God's love, there is no comparing one to the other. There is no good, better, best with God's love. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. My resource material asks the question, what does it mean for us to truly welcome people and, by extension, Jesus and the one who sent him today? I consider this a loaded question in light of what is happening globally. I grew up in an era where if you lived on the wrong side of the tracks, you were of lesser value. You didn't count, you were excluded. Maybe even that last child in the lineup where the captains chose who they wanted on their team and no one was happy because of course that last child had to be on one team or the other. This is only one example of, an ex of exclusion and a more simplistic one considering and comparing to what's happening in the world today. Consider what is happening in the world. This example may not seem important in the scheme of things, but is there a lesson here anyway? Living on the wrong side of the tracks. Maybe it's a case of logistics and the home is closer to work. That's an important factor for the parent or parents who are earning a living. There are many ways to look at a situation and perhaps stopping to look at it from different angles it may lead one to realize there are valid reasons for something to be the way it is and form a different opinion and so become non-judgmental in putting a person in a category that may be exclusionary. We are learning and seeing on the news more devastating ways of excluding and not welcoming peoples. What does it mean for us to truly welcome people? There are people of all colors, persuasions, and abilities who are marching together as a community. I have often said in my messages how we are all children of God. As that child, we are loved and valued. And so, can we not then love ourselves and one another without bias and welcome each other as Jesus is telling us to? I'll go off on another direction, our communion, our Holy Eucharist. In our church family, the table is open to all. Everyone is welcome to partake of this meal of remembrance. It is a meal that includes everyone and excludes no one. After all, Jesus shared the bread and the wine with all who were present. 
he didn't ask questions of his followers that could have had the result of any of them not being included. I, for one, am grateful that at our table, we include all. Then there is our coffee and fellowship time following the service. During passing of the peace, one can invite a new person to stay and enjoy fellowship. We could introduce ourselves or ask the name of the newcomer or visitor. I know we are so often having to be called back to our seats because of conversation that flows at this time. But isn't it a good time to give an extra warm welcome to that person you are greeting with the peace of Christ? When we greet one another, we greet them recognizing that within them, we see the face of Jesus. So many of us are members of groups, book clubs, service clubs, quilt or tatting guilds, discussion groups, committees. We've got a spiritual care committee. We've got uh, the, um, oh, sorry, Helen. Um, Helen's group um, that, um, and she brings us our outreach messages. Can you remember how it felt on your first time attending any of those groups or committees? What was it like when you moved into a new community? What if you had a lousy morning or start to your day and you were wondering what could possibly happen next? And then you were greeted with a smile, a handshake, maybe a hug. What a welcome. And I can say from my heart, a great big thank you to all for their understanding of what happened this morning. Uh, when I wrote that line, I certainly wasn't thinking that I was going to have some glitches. Anyhow, I'll continue now. It can turn your day around. It can remind you that yes, you are loved and yes, you are valued. Jesus associated with people who were the most marginalized in society. He welcomed disciples, apostles, and all whom, and all whom Jesus stood for and with was to welcome not only Jesus, but God too. It did not matter to him if the person was young, old, disabled, ostracized by others. They were always made welcome. How can we as individuals or as a congregation live out the welcome offered by Christ in every aspect of, the, of its life? There are, <clears throat> there are some shows on TV that I really enjoy. The commercials, well, that's another story. That's a good time to make that trip down the hall to that room or head for the kitchen for a snack, that sort of thing. But there's a good one from the Rick Hansen Foundation. They recite a list of people, tall, short, using walkers in a wheelchair, using a cane. And there's wonderful pictures that accompany each of those descriptions. Could those people in that commercial exemplify the little ones that's talked about in the passage that Myrna read this morning. Give a glass of water to one of these little ones. What if Jesus meant more than children as being little? Think of someone you know that in your mind, you would consider them little. A description often used to convey an appealing diminutiveness or express an affectionate attitude. Welcoming, inclusion, come in and join us. Can I offer you refreshments? Can I offer you rest, a place at the table? All ways that say everyone has a place and has value. Let us pray. Loving God, you graciously welcome and love each of us exactly as we are, and you model how we should be with each other. May you be patient with us and help us as we seek to understand what your true welcome and your hospitality really mean 
for how we should be in our communities. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Thanks be to God. And now we'll have Carolyn and Greg. Uh, our next hymn is The Servant Song. We are pilgrims on a journey. And now let us pray. Creator God, through Jesus' teachings, we have learned what it means to be welcoming. We give thanks to this morning, previous mornings, and mornings to come, that we are able to gather as a community. We can be together in our church home, but we are still together, conversing, sharing, smiling, waving. We gather together and recognize the face of God in everyone around us. We come together in community and know that we are part of something much larger than ourselves alone. We come with our different histories, different geographies, different ages, abilities, and connections. We come together. We come blessed by wonder and overwhelmed by bounty. Today we have gathered, some feeling buoyant, some sinking under the weight of life, some full of confidence, others sad, but we are here. We open ourselves to you. We ask for your wisdom, your word, your love and guidance. We ask for your loving kindness on those struggling. We ask that those who are leading and being led in the fight against the virus and the fight to be treated as an equal, feel your guiding hands that the world will become a better place as it struggles. Welcoming God, as we are welcomed into your presence, we welcome you into our lives. May we accept and love one another as you have taught us. May we be a welcoming community for all. Help us to use what we experience here for our journey of faith in the week ahead. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
And our closing hymn is, There's a Spirit in the Air. <clears throat> Uh, okay, there we are. We were called here to worship, and now we are just as surely called into the world to share the love of God with our neighbors, opening our hearts to them, whoever they may be, wherever they may be found. And may God, who brought us into being to care for one another, bless us as we leave. May we be blessed in the air we breathe, the relationships we nurture, and the acts through which love is shared. That God's blessing, light, and love will be known by all. Amen. Amen.